Start setting this all stuff. Yeah, that was just a typer. I picked the paper because uh, I like the way it uh, handles black and white. It gives them a little bit softer tone, um, a little bit creamier paper. It's not exactly white. It's not exactly cream. Warms up a black and white a little bit better than regular uh, luster white paper. So we'll grab this is uh, a Moab paper. It is Moab Juniper Juniper Burita. Uh, it is a um, 305 GSM weight paper, so it's nice heavy. You can see it's creamier. Um, that's the paper tone right there. And then this is a standard luster paper, also from Moab. You can see the difference between the two. Um, this is a nice heavy fiber paper. The Juniper Burita. This is a, their. This is a wonderful paper as well. It's their standard uh, laser exhibition luster, which I use for most of my printing. Um, but for special prints, I like to use this because it uh, it just makes a, a beautiful print at the end of the day. Um, so going through the process here, we got to make sure that we put the right size spindles on. Get everything set and machine. This is better. Um, when it's overly dry, the nozzles tend to jam up a bit, which causes the uh, nozzles to clog, which prevents a clean print from occurring. This is a wonderful machine, the Epson 9900. It's a workhorse. I've been running it now for four or five years. So we're going to run a nozzle check and verify that all the nozzles are firing properly. Oh, we got to make sure that we're pick the right paper over here. So this is a custom paper. It's like I said, it's a heavier paper. So we're, I, I made a custom number for it, custom number one, which widens the plating gap so it doesn't uh, smudge. And we're going to do a nozzle check. This is right here. This is the nozzle check right there. And that is going to print. You can see we are off a little bit. And all right, let's bring out the magnifying glass because I'm getting older. Just to make sure. So we're misfiring on this one. We're misfiring on that one. So we will do a head clean. We're going to mount the picture first because it has uh, the curl in it left from the roll. Uh, this is what's called mount core. It is a uh, foam board, 3 16 foam board that has a heat activated glue on it that we're going to uh, activate by putting it in this vacuum seal mounting press. The vacuum seal mounting press is a gigantic ironing board with a vacuum in it that sucks all the air out. The mount core is pretty cool because it activates at a low temperature. And it only needs about three minutes in the machine. 
less, but I like to put a little bit uh, extra in just to make sure. Okay. Let me feel the print to make sure there's nothing underneath it. Once that's done, we take it, we tack it down with a tacking iron. that cool for just a second so it sticks. We're going to lift this lid up. And we're going to put the piece in between the two release boards. So this is the hot portion up here. It's a gigantic iron board 160 degrees right now. This is the bladder. This is going to, once the vacuum activates, it's going to suck up against the, the, the plate in, which is the hot part going to activate the glue. We'll turn it on. And in three minutes, we'll take it out and it will be mounted to the board. The mounting press is done. It is now, so as you can see, the piece is now vacuumed up against the plate in. And that's what we got to make sure we peel it off. It doesn't go flying somewhere. Take it out. As you can see, it's now flat, adhered to the board. And this has to cool for just a second before I can take this off. Otherwise, it will do. It won't come up as easy. All right. And there is a mounting piece. We've taken the curl out of it. It's adhered to the board. Uh, this is a pH neutral product. So it has, it's not acid free, it's pH neutral. Um, but it is, for photography, it is perfect. Uh, all right, so the next step is uh, we're going to pick out a frame. Um, and uh, I was thinking this one, but what's your, do you have a, what's your professional opinion? No, the digital light is going to be Is there one premier. that, you okay. The difference between the two? Yeah, I, s I was, because you want, when you do something like this, you want it to kind of blend, right, and complement, or do you do a mm. different one to get, like, to make it pop, or... Yeah, I Do mean, you understand so what I'm yes. asking? So okay. this one's going to make, so because we chose this paper because it's creamier, yes. right? So we warmed up a black and white. Black and white can be very cold looking. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. with choosing this paper, yep. we've chosen to warm up all the colors. So this mat, which is the digital white, mm -hmm. is going to go along with that warm color. See how it matches, almost matches the paper yeah, color? Yeah, which Whereas is. Whereas that's going to be a little bit starker. Right. This is the yeah. white. And I, I think. I so doing that is going to bring the coldness back into it. And I'm not saying cold, but yeah, the, I, the cooler, cooler tones, tones. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're going with this white, mm -hmm. you're going to be happier overall. Yes. Now we have the three frame choices. Mm -hmm. We have that one. Okay. We have the one in the same family, but a little bit larger. Mm -hmm. All right. I think you were going to like this one because you wanted something with a little bit of silver in it, but we like to show everybody our choices. Mm -hmm. I know. That one. That's the one. All right. So, very good. We will All go right. ahead and do that. And we're going to put, um, we're going to do ultra view glass on this. Ultra view glass is a water white glass that doesn't change the color of anything. Mm -hmm. Offers very limited UV, but you're not going to put it in, you're putting it in an inside wall without yeah, light. Yeah. So, see how that doesn't change the color of the print at all? Right, it's the same. Yeah. So this is called Ultra View. Okay. Yeah, it has a, a little bit of, of UV protection, but not, not it's all It's not like it. museum. Yeah, the museum glass. glass changes the color a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd recommend that if you were going to put it into a room that has lots of light from 
outside sources. Okay. Or lots of light from UV sources. But I know the I know the space you're going to be putting it in because we looked at it prior to this mm -hmm. in use. Gotcha. So, all right. So we're all set. We're going to get this frame and that mat. Mm -hmm. Unless you're changing your mind now. I might be changing my mind. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Which is part of the uh, part of the process. Is it? Do yeah. people change their minds a lot, yeah. or? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Okay. I, I always get the question asked by a customer, which is, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. and I always tell them I will never put a frame on the table that I don't think goes with the piece. See this so everything I put on the table mm -hmm. that I show you, I think will go with the piece. And at that point, it's a personal preference. I think I like this one better. Yeah? Yeah. It's a nice frame. I like this one. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather do this one. Yeah. Yeah, this is this has a more portrait look to it. Mm -hmm. I um, like it's thicker too. Yeah. And more, I feel more classic. Yeah. So if I wanted to do something else with some of the other portraits, yeah. I'm still gonna. Right, you're not gonna. You're I don't not worry about clashing. Clash, correct? Yeah. But I tend not to worry about clashing too much. Okay. In framing, um, you're never going to stray f far from your style. Mm -hmm. So. So Ever. Real, do you, yeah. is that what you tend to find with a lot of customers? Yeah. If they, especially if they keep coming back in, they yep. tend to have. They a tend to have a style. I have one customer that came in today who, every single thing he frames is the same frame, same mats. But That's he loves he does it. it. That's the way he likes his stuff. All right. Um, but if you go with different frames, it's we call it eclectic, and that's an eclectic style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're never going to go. You're not going to pick this and then go ahead and you know pick that. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, they're similar style as far as shape, but the color's Close. different. It's a furniture finish. Yes. And you're definitely not going to pick that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And then pick this. No. That's not your style. Correct. So. All right. But that wouldn't look bad with that because, like you said, mm -hmm. this is a classic look. Mm -hmm. It's a simple frame. Mm -hmm. It will go almost anywhere. The whole process of putting the frame on a piece is to make the overall portrait look like one unit. Do you want the mat and the frame to disappear but mm -hmm. not be invisible? Correct. You want to look at the portrait, but look at the whole thing as a full package. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like, um, I don't know, like a, the whole car, you know? Mm -hmm. you, know mm -hmm. you, you, you put nice tires on the car, mm -hmm. nice wheels on the car, it adds to the whole look of the of vehicle, the vehicle. Mm -hmm. but the wheels and the tires aren't what you're looking at. You're looking at the car. Exactly. So. Excellent. Good? Okay. Perfect. Good to go. Let's Thank go get you. our frame made. Well, let's go get our frame. <laughs> CNC mat cutter, designed specifically for the picture framing industry. It is the Ferrari of mat cutters, made in Italy. Um, so we're going to measure the piece, make sure it is what it is. We should know what it is, but just making sure. 23 and a half, 15 and a half. All right. So we have our inside measurement. We know that we're going to make it uh, as a standard size for that size image. This is, we're just inputting the numbers into the system. Uh, this will put a three and a quarter inch mat around that piece, which is a pretty standard size uh, mat for that size piece. You always want to uh, Apply a mat and frame that is proportionately sized to the piece that you're framing. You don't want something too big and you don't want something too small. Um, you also want the mat to be slightly larger than the frame itself. Uh, you don't want a thin mat on it. It does not look right. It looks kind of ridiculous um, and it does not look professional. So um, we're going to pick the mat out, which we already did. We're going to pull it off the shelf. Uh, and as you can see, I have. My stock of it, this is an eight ply mat. 
meaning there are eight various plies of paper product. These are all conservation grade boards. They are treated for to keep the acidity level down, um, acidity uh, neutral. Uh, they're conservation grade, so it means they will not harm the print, damage the print. In fact, the technology uh, has uh, evolved to uh, allow these mats to actually pull impurities out of the airspace around the artwork and suck it into the mat so that it uh, keeps it from harming the artwork. All right, so we have all our settings in there. Uh, this is going to be a 22 inch tall by 30 inch wide matting job. Uh, it is uh, three and a quarter inches around and it will frame the piece very nicely. So. All right, so I'm going to grab, grab our molding the customer picked. Um, I always grab a little extra than what I normally would need, just in case there's flaws in the molding, which often happens because that's the nature of life. Nothing is ever perfect until you make it perfect. So all this comes wrapped in mummy wraps, which Drive me crazy, but again, that is the nature of the product. So you can see on the underside of this is where they had sprayed it. While well, you get that gray, see the gray in here? The underlying underneath the black. That's because before they sprayed the black on, they had sprayed the white underneath. And then they sprayed the black on top to get that muted charcoal gray color in there. So again, we're going to wrap more than we need. Just in case while we're in the middle of cutting, there is a ding, a dent, a flaw somewhere in the frame. And sometimes that happens. And some manufacturers will mark the inferior product, product placement of a ding or a scratch or a dent uh, with a sticker. And they'll give me a, what's called an allowance. And we are lucky that none of these have any of those stickers on them. All right. So we know the size is 22 inches by 30 inches. Uh, we are going to measure this frame here, the width of it, so we can get the outside measurements, feed it to the computer. This is the controlling arm of the, of the, uh, of the saw, as you can see from over there. Uh, this device controls the measuring guide which gives us the size of our first, what we call leg of the frame. There are four legs to a frame. Uh, you always cut the larger sizes first. Uh, and the reason you do that is if there's a mistake made with the larger size, uh, or if there's a flaw in it, you are more likely to be able to use that larger size to cut down to the smaller size so you're not wasting too much material. Uh, this is a loud machine, so we wear earplugs. I also wear a mask filter because the dust that comes off of this is very fine. So bear with me as I make the frame.
This is a joining table. This is a joining machine. This is what's called an underpinner. Not an undertaker, but an underpinner. Uh, it is purpose is to put what is called a V-nail based on the shape of the product. They are a V-shape. And the whole purpose behind a V-nail is when the machine shoots it in, uh, the nail is splayed out and it goes in. And then because of the nature of the steel, it pulls back in. So that brings the two sides of your frame together closer to get a nice tight join. So that's what's in this machine. Um, again, another very specific machine. This one, they make them all over the world. This one happens to be made in France. At the time that I bought it many years ago, it was the best machine on the market. Still is, it's a workhorse. What I'm doing now is I'm coloring the edge. Uh, we do that so that you have a finished look. Sometimes some moldings are slightly off. It's the nature of wood. So what happens is there's even just a millimeter of space difference between one piece of the molding and another piece of the molding, you might see a little bit of an edge, and that's why we color it, so you don't see it. All right. Now that we're all marked up, we're going to measure the frame. We're going to put the, the part number, I mean not the part number, the sizes into this tool, this device over here, which is the computer brain, the input device behind this machine. We're going to do that. We're going to measure the width. And because this machine is made in France, they run off of millimeters, which is probably very foreign to many of you, except for the European people who are watching this or Canadians. Uh, we are 37 millimeters. Frankly, I prefer the millimeters. It's easier to do. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to find a place in the frame where you want to put your first nail. Uh, you don't want to go back too close to the edge because sometimes these nails have a tendency to follow grain and it could go backwards and split out the back. So I usually put a minimum 10 millimeters into the frame. I make a little mark. I don't know if you can see the mark I just made. And then you measure up to the height because it's a tall mold and I can get two of my nails stacked. They'll stack it, they'll fire one, they'll fire a second one. But between the three spaces, I'm going to put two very tall nails here, and two smaller nails on each of these. Uh, this is a harder frame, so we're gonna put a hold down. Um, the green one is a, is a harder plasticized rubber, and so it will hold down the uh, frame a little bit better than the yellow one, which is softer and has a little give to it. Glue is what holds this thing together. So the nails are there to support it and hold together while the glue is drying. I will sometimes over glue a little bit and I always wipe it down afterwards. We're gonna put the nails, everything is ready to go. So we're going to take a short leg and put it on the right hand side <coughs> and a long leg on the left hand side and we're going to just put them together to test fit it. Make some small adjustments. I'm going to set this to automatic so I can hold the frame with my hands. I'm going to step on the pedal. When I step on the pedal, the clamps are going to come in, hold the frame together. This is then going to come down, press down on the top while a firing pin comes below and pushes the nail up into the frame uh, from below. Fire two nails. It's going to change the nail size. Move forward, move forward, and there you go. One finished corner. I got to do that three more times to get a finished frame. Words of the warning. Words of the warning. 
do not get your finger stuck underneath there. While that plunger is coming down to hold the top of the frame. to the last join of the frame. I'm drilling it out. You're actually pushing wood together. So what ends up happening is it pushes out a little bit. You get a little bit of a gap on the back edge sometimes. So when you putty it, take out that gap. Somehow we discovered, I don't remember where it was, we discovered that baby wipes take off putty very easily. Actually, baby wipes take off almost everything. Putty is one of those things that gets on everything. So before we're, while we're done, when we're done making, putting the frame up, we'll go wash our hands for the 20 or 30th time today. The problem with the framers is we have to wash our hands all day long. We get all the putty and dust and grime from working on making frames off of our hands, but we can't use hand lotion until after the day is over because we will get hand lotion all over mats and artwork. All right, so this is a sheet of Ultraview glass. Uh, we're gonna cut it on our glass cutter. And be careful with glass, it is sharp. We're gonna put it down on here very carefully so it does not break. You cut it to 30 inches. So we line it up over here at 30 inches. And we're going to cut the glass here. We're going to cut to 22 inches, which is the exact size we need. Careful, don't get glass in your eyeball. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna blow the piece off with our air gun. All right, I inspect everything very closely five six times per piece as I'm framing it I'm looking for dark specks on the mat and light specks in this dark piece next we put the frame on and if everything goes well it will fit All right, so I put four points in just to hold it in place so I can look at it again, make sure there is nothing on the mat, nothing on the print, and I can seal it all up now.
before I wrap it. So we're applying ATG to the back of this so we can then put a paper back to seal it. It's called a dust cover. Pull out enough. Tear it off. Thumb was about a third down, right? So, okay. you know, about, I mean, this is 25, so if you put it at about eight, that would be about a third. And we start a pilot hole there. And as you yeah. said, <coughs> okay. And you kind of put it at a slight angle, not straight across, because you want the wire to do that. All right, maximum weight. Okay. And I would say that most picture frames, especially one this size, don't weigh more than five to seven pounds. We put our branding logo down here, like so. so not distributing your weight, number one. Uh, so this becomes a point where the wire will start to lose its, uh, its um, ability to hold, and it could actually break. Uh, you put any kind of tension on it. Mm -hmm. But it also, when you're hanging a piece up... It's not balanced. It's not balanced, so you get back and forth. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you put it on two spots, there you go. it's balanced. Right? Mm -hmm. It turned out lovely. It is absolutely beautiful. As you can see, we finished this piece. Uh, we've been able to uh, track this from the point where we saw it on our computer screen uh, to the point where we picked out our, our papers, we printed it, we picked out our mats and frame, we cut the mat, cut the frame, got everything together uh, till you get a finished piece. Now, a very important thing is when working with a professional photographer such as this one right here, Walter Van Dusen, uh, Every photographer that I work with, especially Walter, uh, guarantees their piece for life as long as it is framed by a professional framer, especially with me. Uh, I guarantee everything for life. Uh, I stand behind my product. The photographers, professional photographers, stand behind their product. Uh, that way, there's a guarantee to the customer that you have a perfect portrait for your family's entire life to pass down from generation to generation. Our photographer to take our first family photo, which is now what you see here, and the whole experience from start to finish has been just an absolutely amazing and wonderful experience to be a part of. A beautiful and wonderful memory that, mm -hmm. again, I will have on my wall for time to come, and especially even sometimes those tough days, I have something where I could come home to that will bring a smile to my face. And as Joel has also mentioned, this is something that will be passed on to my family, to my kids, for hopefully generations to come. Thank you so much both to you yeah. and to Walter Van Dusen for this beautiful family portrait.